Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. I have a guest today that I've known for a long time. We have so much in common about things we love to do and and some of our paths that uh, I almost feel like he's my bigger brother or something. Uh, whenever I need a good chuckle, I can call him or swap an email with him. Uh, but he lives north of the border, lives way up in northern Alberta, Canada, and I think part of the value of having this discussion with Richard Mellon, Rich as I call him, uh, is that you're going to get to see how things are slightly different than Canada. You know, we say the North American model of wildlife conservation, but each state has its own kind of spin on it in Canada. Each province has its own spin on it, and there's some differences in how Canada does it, how the U.S. does it. Um, so I think you'll get some of that. You'll get some laughs because Rich does not take himself seriously at all. He is always excited to talk hunting, fishing, and in, and in the case of what we're going to talk about today, trapping. Rich, like me, started out trapping. And I use my platforms, whether it's this or YouTube channel, because I want to talk about trapping. Trapping has a place in our wildlife system. And some people, I know a lot of hunters and a lot of anglers are like, ah, oh, trapping, blah, 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 blah. You know, they have a negative connotation to it. Uh, and I don't know if this will change anyone's mind, but... I don't ever shy away from the fact that I grew up trapping, that I paid for my first semester in college trapping beaver and muskrats. Uh, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's what I grew up doing. So did Rich, and Rich now has platforms. Uh, it's called Trapping Inc., and it's based out of Canada, very, very popular in Canada. And he just got some great ideas of, you know, he his world in Canada and, and the things that he does uh, gives him some perspectives, some very honest insights to what he sees and how he does things. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, for me... I, I, I could sit and listen to it all day. Uh, so I wanted him to share just a conversation, me and him talking about trapping and how it's kind of been woven through our lives. Uh, here I am, I produce hunting content, which is has so many parallels to trapping. And I think R Rich will tell us when I click the button here that he thinks that trapping has made him a way better hunter. I know it has for me. Uh, some of the best hunters I know have a trapping background. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. All things related to trapping and stuff like that. And if nothing else, uh, I hope you learn from it. I hope you realize that there's this crazy Canadian, as my wife calls him, uh, that has some cool platforms that maybe you want to tune into uh, and just learn what what he's up to and and how some of these things are maybe different than what you currently listen to or currently watch so but before we do that we want to thank Leupold, uh title sponsor of this podcast uh supporter of all we do in the world of public land conservation access all that stuff go to loophole.com check out all their optics and i hope that when you're out buying optics that you consider them yeah maybe support them for all the support that they give us. Nosler, uh, Nosler Ammunition. Uh, a few episodes back, we had John Nosler on, told the story about this classic American small business, still a family-held business, uh, making amazing products. Uh, if you're an elk hunter, you probably, if someone says elk hunting bullet, you probably instantly think Nosler Partition. But go to Nosler.com, uh, check out all their stuff. Uh, they have an online store now. And uh, if, if you're out there hunting, uh, there's a very good chance that you're probably going to be thinking about Nosler products as the good solution for what you want to do. Uh, 
I'm going to throw this one in here, even though they're not an official sponsor of the podcast. My good buddy Jim at Kenetrek, I've been using his boots pretty much since he started in, I don't know, 2005 or six, something like that. But right now, we have a promo code with them that if you go buy a pair of their boots, they're going to throw in a pair of their hunting gaiters, which I think is a $75 gaiter. Uh, but you got to use promo code Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to get that. So go to Kenetrek.com. It's that time of year where you got to start getting your feet in the shape that they need to be for hunting season. And I think this is a, a promo code that is always out there. I just don't do a good enough job telling people about it. Use promo code Randy at Kenetrek Boots. And in the process, you're going to get yourself a, fair, a pair of free hunting gaiters. And then we got Wild Alaska Seafood Box, my buddy John over there. Uh, we had him on the podcast earlier this summer also. If you want to help support uh, sustainable seafood harvest with small boats and small businesses, John's the guy connecting people to that. Go to the Wild Alaska Seafood Box dot com use promo code randy and you're going to get scallops scallops for the life of your subscription and then we got go hunt if you go to the go hunt uh, dot com and you sign up for the insider and use promo code randy they're going to give you a 50 dollars gift card to shop in their gear shop and then i want to talk about their gear shop i don't talk about this enough maybe i should because we don't pay retail for anything and what i mean by that is my goal is to make sure none of my listeners ever have to pay retail. Or if you pay retail, you get some sort of discount. So if you go to the gear shop out at gohunt.com and when you check out, you use promo code Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, they're going to give you 10% off everything in your cart. But they did remind me, hey, Randy, you know, when they're using our free gift card for signing up for the Insider, they can't double dip, so... Anytime after you use your free gift card, $50 gift card, after that, save 10% on all of your outdoor purchases. That's, that's like a standing invite. And they have the serious, serious stuff for the outdoor enthusiasts. Those of us who hunt backcountry hunting, western hunting is their specialty. They got it. So anyhow, I'm going to hit the button here. And my buddy Rich is up there in Canada, probably tapping his fingers on the counter saying, is this guy ever going to get done, man? I, I got things to do here. So uh, thanks for being here, folks. Hope you're doing well. Uh, hope you enjoy this conversation. I can assure you, if nothing else, Rich and I are going to have a lot of fun telling stories and talking trapping for the next hour or so. Here we go. All right, folks. I told you that when I hit the button here, one of my great friends in the outdoor space, who happens to be from north of the 49th parallel, Richard Mellon, was going to join us because, well, he's just the coolest dude in the outdoor space. Do you know you're the most interesting man in the outdoor space, Rich? (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 who did who did i pay to, for you to say that <laughs> uh, well i really appreciate you being here i know that you i appreciate being invited i mean you you have such a huge audience uh in the the lower 49 and uh we <laughs> love <laughs> lower 49 you always got to get some dig in there <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking, watching a, a doe uh, whitetail and, and her fawn, and, and they've, they're so used to, uh, you know, out of my, out my office window here out on the ranch, and, and uh, they are so used to us. Even the dogs don't bark at them anymore. And, wow. And, uh, but, you know, this is a little brief window we have, of, you know, where where uh, inside of uh, four or five weeks, we will have snow again. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's kind of nice to be able to look, look at the green a little bit for now. Well, I was surprised that I could talk you out of walleye fishing on a beautiful July day. What, what's the deal? Sandy didn't give you money for gas in your boat or something? Or <laughs> Actually, it's been one of those years where, and I, I guess maybe, maybe it's that whole virus attitude everybody's got, but we had plans of staying home and not traveling at all this year. Well, not traveling after after the end of May. We, we were going to... Uh, uh, to do a bunch of renovations, home renovations, and uh, the the house here I built in uh, 2007, so it never 
Sandy, of course, you know, you know what happens the week after you get done building a house? Well, maybe I should have painted that wall a different color. That oh, starts, yeah. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I held it off for 13 years. And, and, uh, not, and the worst part of all of that is, you know, we have over 70 pieces of taxidermy. We, oh. we, uh, yeah, we we love we love taxidermy, and, and you know most of the time when you go someplace, you think, well, this is the one time I'm going to be here, so we are going to do this, and then we end up going back many many times. But but all that has to come down off the walls, you know, huh. and and uh, and being a, a home builder, I mean, it's 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 what what has uh, fed fed the family for most years is, is is me as a builder. My wife then has this carte blanche. You know, I mean, not only do I never complain about how many shoes she buys, because <laughs> she never complains about how many guns I have either, but she claims them all anyway. So, uh, so I have this this carte blanche uh, she has where she just decides that anything she sees, oh, Rich can do that. And because it's Rich doing it, well, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things was is, is there, there's a new trend in in um, uh, uh, pattern ceilings. So I had to take uh, a house is I don't know, two thousand square feet or whatever on the on the main floor, and and uh, I had to take and 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 poly all of the walls, wet down the old ceiling, scrape it all down, re uh, you know uh, repoint it, retouch it, get and reprime it, and then do all the new texturing and all that. That was like uh, including. Cleaning out all of the the trophies and all that. that that was two weeks. Yeah, that was two weeks. You know, and, <laughs> and she's she's so freaking hilarious because <laughs> we get done and I'm putting up like the last trophy in, in uh, on the wall and it's this it, this is a big kudo and it, it, it and it, and it's a, a shoulder pedestal mount so it's an ugly thing to hang on the wall right wow. it's hard to get it all yeah. and I get it up there and I'm sweating and and behind her I hear her say. You know, maybe we should have painted that and a different color. And and I whip her out, and she's looking there, laughing. She's grinning. You know, she. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I think I got to tell people how long I've known you, so that they understand that when you and I are cracking some of this inside joke, that they know I'm not going to run and tell Sandy what you might have said. I might send her a link to the podcast, <laughs> but when did we meet? 20, 20 some years ago? When were you guys doing yes. Outdoor Quest? Are you, we at, started at in, nine, in 99. We started in 99. Wow. That was our, our, our premier year. And it was all in the U.S. Like, I mean, for the yeah. first three, four years, three years for sure. It was It was exclusively in the U.S. And then I think after... After about year seven, then we were just exclusively in, in Canada. But we needed to set up um, a U.S. corporation. And yeah. uh, a, a fishing buddy of mine recommended you. Oh, man. You know? you, you're probably still mad at him for that. Poor Jim. But, uh, he, he, he wasn't a good fisherman either. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known that. Uh, <laughs> so in that process, I got to know you and Sandy. Uh, I got to know TJ, your your kind of partner in crime when you guys were doing Outdoor Quest, and that's what he does now. He does Outdoor yeah. Quest TV, right? And that's on Wild TV in Canada? No, he's on Sportsman's Channel, and he's going oh. to be airing on Sportsman's Channel, um, I believe, Q1, I think, uh, in the U.S. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, they yeah. can go he's... watch our buddy TJ on Sportsman's Channel down here then. Yeah, well, we, we worked together for a long time, and we started uh, Trapping Inc., um, We've been just successful enough to keep us hooked, kind of thing. <laughs> it, it, it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like being a little bit junky, but you're not you're <laughs> you're not you're you're not falling down to the street losing your job yet, kind of thing. But you're you're successful enough, right? You, you haven't sold your teeth or something. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, only a Canadian would say sold your teeth because all you <laughs> hockey players, you guys have teeth that you can go down to the pawn shop and pawn your front plate. So that's what exactly. that's so my audience is thinking that's the first time I've ever heard someone say sell your teeth. Well, if you lived in Canada, that's what you go you go down and you pawn your front teeth or your dentures. <laughs> 
Well, yeah. if you were any good, and if you're in, you know, the, the semi pros or whatever, I mean, about the time that you needed a, needed a, a front plate, you were swimming in money. So there was usually some golden ball and that kind of stuff. <laughs> 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 uh, sure, as long as you had a, a, a case of uh, of Labatt's Blue and, a, a, and mm-hmm. gas in your pickup truck and your in your teeth, you had it made, right? <laughs> oh, you you were living high, man. You you were big time in it. So you, oh, yeah. you decide to start trapping ink, you and Sandy. And yeah, well, when, when was that? Well, we're going to be start filming our seventh season here. Uh, well, we actually started filming our seventh season. So uh, uh, season six is, is what's airing right now. We, where I was going with about selling my teeth was, was that we've been kind of sort of successful. We're probably the most successful outdoor programming like with uh, Outdoor Quest in Canada as far as being profitable. I mean, we were making a living at it, right? Yeah. And But you just not a, a bunch. When you're formatted for TV, when that is your, that broadcast uh, license is your uh, your main driver in your income and in that you've, you've only got in Canada, you only have uh, 12 commercials. There's six minutes worth of, of, uh, of broadcast commercials. And so, you know, if, if you're doing really, really good, probably the Canadian average for commercials um, for other shows and that is probably, you know, up maybe up to $10,000 for, for uh, an entire year. Well, hmm. you know, 12 times, times that's $120,000. We were we had much better numbers, much more uh, wider universe than that. So I mean, we were doing quite a bit better than that. But still, it wasn't enough for for two. You know, yeah. there was TJ and I, right? Yep. And we've always had uh, a, a wonderful partnership where um, we we paid hard costs like uh, you know our uh, editing and and uh, uh, camera equipment and all that kind of stuff came out of the company. But when it came to hunting. You know, if I wanted to hunt Africa and he wanted to hunt uh, deer at, in Alberta, well, there's no reason he should be paying for my my travel expenses. And that. So we covered our own travel expenses. So it was kind of one of those. Uh, what, what was that accounting fellow tell me? It was it was inventive accounting that made it look like we we're turning a profit. <laughs> Creative accounting. We were cooking the books. Yeah, we were. <laughs> but we so we paid our own expenses. So there just wasn't enough. Um, sellable assets you know there wasn't enough uh, enough commercials available in a single show so we brought up another show and tj wanted to bring up a fishing show in the beginning uh, outdoor quest was half fishing and half hunting every every episode yep yeah and it was i really enjoyed the format because i mean fishing is really easy to do and i enjoyed the format because there was something for everybody right we were we had ladies on the show we were Perhaps one of the very first shows that had our wives hunting with us. Yep. You know, in in ninety nine there wasn't much of it. Um and we had some really unique reactions over that. Some guys were, you know, God bless you, does she have a sister and, and you're so lucky and, <laughs> <laughs> and the next guy was, You poor bugger, you can't get away from her even out, out in Moose Camp, you know. <laughs> 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 so we, we we were looking for you know we wanted to once it went to solely just to hunting because we were told by by sponsors make a choice hunting or fishing while well, hunting yep. was it was easy choice and once you went there you end up with all these category killers and you're aware too in your uh, in your own ventures is that you know you have one scope that you deal with you know one rifle that you deal with one ammo you know that kind of thing right yep and as long as you're stuck in endemic. You know, which are within the within the sport of hunting, uh, you get pretty limited after a while. Yep. And we had have some wonderful sponsors, but we just could not make enough money to to make it really profitable, right? Mm-hmm. So we decided to bring up that second show, and TJ wanted to do fishing because you know fishing is easy. I mean, you could you could do a thirteen episode season in in two weeks if you were on the road, right? It was easy. Right. Uh, but we had a sponsor that was um, advertising with us on on Outdoor Quest, and it was Trapper Gord. And hmm. Trapper Gord is, is Gordy Claus, and he lives just across the river from me. I'm on one. I'm on the uh, uh, the west side of, of the Smoky River, and he's on the east side of the Smoky River, and that, that's where his store is. And and uh, he was the sponsor. We were getting so much feedback about. Well, when is Trapper Gord's show starting? When is Trapper Gord's show starting? Uh, you know, 
most times, and you're very well aware of this, but your your fans are not always the most intuitive about what's going on. <laughs> you know, we, we we would run bumps. You know, that 15 second bumps was saying, you know, Trapper Gord says watch. You know, and advertising your sponsor plus advertising your show, right? Yep. It would be the same thing with with the rifle company or, or with with the ammo company or whatever. You know, see so one. One week could be this this bump, and the next week could be that bump. But but whenever we were running these these traffic gourd bumps, and it was us and uh, Wild TV were flooded with uh, when does the traffic start? When does the traffic start? And so I had long discussions with TJ, and he wasn't sure. He thought it was far too uh, graphic. I guess that would be the the kindest yeah. word to put. Far too graphic to put on on TV, and it kind of set me back because it's it's always been my life, right? Um, it's hard. There are things in everybody's lives, you know, like I had a buddy the other day, other day talked about, you know, they, they had put up 30 gallons of peanuts for in peanut butter. And I was like, 30 gallons. I've never seen that much peanut butter in my whole life. So we had this great <laughs> conversation about peanut. <laughs> I know, don't get me started on vines. What kind of vine is that in the woods? It drives my wife crazy. But, <laughs> but you know, this was something that was just so normal in his life. And he just, he looked at me like I had three eyes because I couldn't understand what you did with all this peanut butter, right? Yep. And, and so when, you know, he, he was challenging me about trapping, was it going to be acceptable and all, and all that kind of stuff on TV? And I says, well, it's going to be real. He says, well, do you think? I says, well, the, it, in a lot of ways, it's it's neater than than hunting is because the animals are dead when you get there. Yeah. In in our situation here in the, in the north, they're, they're dead. Um, you know, you can exp- explain what happened in that. Yeah, some of them are, are nice and furry and all that. But at the same time, Swamp People was huge on TV. Yeah. And when I watched them and watched, uh, you know, the, you know, not to sugarcoat it, and I, I know your fans are understand, but they're out there and they're gut hook, hooking a gator on a with a big hook in a in the belly and and you know they're jerking on it and and eventually shoot it in the head and that uh, I thought mm, they make us look really normal. It's time for trapping to be on TV. <laughs> Uh, well, you you need to work on the accent a bit, then, Rick, because I can understand you, Troy, and those guys. They sound like they got a mouth full of marbles down there when they're talking. I can't quite make them out. So, well, you know, but I love our life, and 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 you you love your life. I mean, when you get to travel and meet people, I've met Troy. I sat down and and uh, he he was actually to Calgary one year to to do a speaking a speak and greet and that kind of stuff when they were big. Yep. And it was, uh, we probably had our TV show up and running two, two years. So I don't know, four years ago, something like that. And, uh, the, uh, show managers were, were girls or ladies and they were not outdoors people whatsoever. And they were just flat out panicked that Troy was going to, sh- you know, wh- who was going to take care of Troy? Cause they had nothing in common with, with him at all. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of funny how people who are not in the industry think that we're just that weird. Like you could go, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but you, you could, you could put on a nice shirt and tie and, and, and take your, your, uh, your, your beautiful wife with you and people wouldn't, wouldn't blink, right? Yep. But when they they say that you're you're Randy the Hunter, now all of a sudden they they're, they're afraid that they've got nothing to talk to you about, you know, like you don't read or or <laughs> or follow politics or whatever, right? So <laughs> these these poor girls were just in a panic. So I, I get there and uh, Troy likes to drink beer, and uh, and Canadian beer is a little bit more potent than what he was <laughs> used yep. to. <laughs> and so we have and I sat and we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked and it was there was so much commonality because we were both trappers. They, you know, he lived in a very different world than I did, you know, in Louisiana. And mm-hmm. it was it was fascinating. You know, he says to me when I finally run into him, because when he, he showed up from the airport that I was I was doing a seminar. And uh, so I Lori gets hold of me and I go, get over there and, and I get talking with him. And he says, they tell me. You know, in that accent, his I can't even begin yeah. to do that. Yeah, he says that that you you trap north of here somewhere. I says, yeah, I trap uh, uh, about ten and a half hours north of, of Calgary. Ten and a half hours north? What do you catch up there, Sandy Claus? <laughs> 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 uh, with that wonderful accent of his, oh my god! I just—it was just the greatest thing, right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> so. <laughs> He he actually started as a kid as a trapper, and they trapped mink. Okay. Now, 
That was what they what they trapped, and, and the reason he was the best mink trapper in the parish. And I had to afterwards. He kept saying parish, and that I had to go look up what parish was, and it just means yeah. county. Yep. Yeah. In, in 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 Creole or French or whatever it is. Anyway, he was the best mink trapper in the parish, and I says I says, well, you know, I'm being respectful and all, and I says, so you you're the hardest worker. Nope. My dad owned a, a catfish trot line, and I got all the bait. <laughs> 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 so, he, had, he had the inside track. Yeah, he did. He did. It was bait was what was all, all what was all important. And and I guess when you think about it, because it's so hot there, I mean, bait would last one day, right? Yeah. And then it would and then it would be just something oozing and running. But he his dad would would check um, his trot trot line every morning and clean all day, and then he would get what was left over for that evening, and he'd go out and set mink traps. And he had a buddy because he had so much bait. He had a buddy that he he cut in on the deal, and they were always competing. You know, next day what they were checking. Guess how many mink they could catch in an evening? Uh, 20. His best night, he caught 68, and he, he says, says meets his buddy, you know, because they meet up at daybreak kind of thing yeah. with, with their, their catch and everything. He says, I got you. I got you. You're not going to beat me. I got 68, you know. And his buddy looks at him, and he had 92. Holy smoke. That would be a and season for a lot of people. That's a huge number. That's yeah. a huge. I've never. That's a hundred and fifty some mink in an evening. I, I've never done that in a in a whole year. year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. And I said to them, I said, you know, but they weren't worth a lot, right? And you know, we got into talking about what prime was and and uh, full heavy and all that kind of stuff. And he believed it had to do with the cold. And I mean, prime actually has to do with with daylight. Yeah. Um, it's just like all the animals that you hunt, their, their rut is controlled by daylight. The, yep. the amount of daylight, it's, it's got nothing to do with cold. Everybody always says, Oh, pretty good fossil. The punk and the moose are going to be going tonight. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's not true. Yeah. All <laughs> that's not true period. It, it is. It is. So prime is actually refers to the thickness of the leather. Yep. Okay, so how thick that leather, leather is, and when you turn it, when you skin it, and you can see black on the inside, yeah. that means you're actually looking at the root hairs, and yep. so it's not prime. As that leather gets thicker, that all becomes white. Then there's a difference between, and that's all controlled by daylight. But what controls how heavy it is, so the quality of the fur is by cold, and that's when we get into you know uh, fall ratings, medium ratings, and, and full heavy. That's what that's what we look for. Is you know like my my Martin in December are all full heavy, and they they go top lot. Yep. So the the reason that I wanted you and I to have this discussion, besides the fact that you'd probably rat me out a little bit by telling some old <laughs> stories you knew of me. Uh, <laughs> Is to talk about <laughs> trapping because uh, you you and I talk enough. You know that I grew up. I was trapping before I was hunting, and most people know me on my platforms for hunting and marriage advice. And uh, I'm not very good at either of them. Uh, you know, I warn people: whatever advice you get from me is probably worth what you paid for it. So be careful. Uh, the The idea, though, is. The, the fact that TJ was worried about how trapping would be perceived by an audience is, I think, is very uh, reasonable. I, uh, I think all of us have a little bit of that concern when we show trapping is it's got this, it's been painted a certain way. But for me, growing up trapping, growing up in a little rural area where the, the quality of a Christmas that you were going to have was dependent upon how many mink, fisher, and red fox the family caught and sold to the fur buyer by December 15th. Uh, to me, trapping has zero stigma, has nothing but fond memories, and has been a learning experience for me as I then went to hunting and fishing and other things. And so... I'm just wanting my audience to know and, and to hear from somebody who traps as much as you do and has been as successful as you have, just a discussion about what trapping really is and how for a lot of people in a lot of places, that is your first gateway to outdoor activities. 
And so. That, absolutely. Absolutely. You that's know, where we're going today. It, it I, is, I, I hope you brought, is, brought your lunch because this is going to be a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked a lot about how can I trap? Yeah. And people have, to begin with, we have this terrible stigma about trapping. And, and it's because the very nature of trappers for a long, long time, we were all secretive. Yep. And that goes back to when, when, when the, the fur trade founded in Canada 400 years ago. You know, they were out chasing, or, you know, the fellas down, down south there, you know, Kit Carson and all that, when they went, went beaver trapping and, you know, and, and found Montana and those, those kind of places. It was because they wanted it to be a secret because they didn't want anybody, any competition. They didn't need anybody following along with them. So by our very nature, trappers have been secretive for a long time. And, and we, have continued that even in the, in the modern day and it has been to our detriment because we've allowed ourselves to get kicked around yep and we ha- we have allowed um our you know our, our industry to 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 be abused by by the antis and they've taken grotesque advantage of the fact that we we don't draw attention we don't use media much and that was part of the whole thing with with starting up trapping inc was i was kind of looking for a fight and so at, at this point it, it, <laughs> At this point, if Sandy was here, she'd be rolling her eyes, you know, like, <laughs> uh, kind of. <laughs> and it, and it, turned, it turned right around on me. I mean, and, and it turned around in a wonderful way because our, our reactions have been fantastic. You know, we've, we've have, we have very, very little negative feedback. The saddest feedback we have is I didn't know trapping was still legal, you know. Yeah. So when... <laughs> When you had things like PETA and that taking advantage of the trappers and the fact that trappers aren't vocal or don't don't want to be uh, public and all that, they, they, there was a lot of lies that were put out there that people that automatically colors people's uh, thoughts and that you know like there's a lot of talk today about systemic racist or, or uh, racism or unconscious bias. Well, when anybody who is not a trapper hears the word trapping he was they immediately think of animals being skinned alive yeah that was an absolute genius um attack on trapping by, by Peter and that and it, it's totally false mm-hmm. it is totally false i'll tell you everybody right here and now there is no reason why anybody would would, would skin a, an animal alive for one thing you know yourself that hunters and trappers are among, amongst the most kind-hearted conservationists out there, yep. even though we kill, mm-hmm. we do not we do not have things suffer. That is that that is just against it. So, you're why would you skin that fox alive? He's not going to grow new, grow new skin. Um, it takes a, a few seconds to kill it, and then the whole value of that fox is in 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 that hide. And you can't get that hide off him in any, in any good shape when, when it's trying to bite you and scratch you and, and carry on. Like, I, I mean, just think about this. How dumb are people, right? And I don't, I don't, I don't mean to be angry with with the the people who believe it because most people are are far too emotional. They 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 lead with their hearts. And God bless us. Whenever whenever that ends, we're society's in a real big trouble. But because they lead with their hearts, they they're taken advantage of by things like PETA. Yep. So th- that very first uh, reaction that people have is they think of animals being skinned alive. And, and I do a lot to combat that and try and explain to people, you know, try and, and then they talk about fur farms. Well, I'm no fan of fur farms because it has hurt my industry a lot, the wild industry. I understand its place. It is a form of agriculture and, they're regulated that way, and they're highly regulated. So they are not, they are not anything as to what uh, the, they're made out to be either. Um, I, even though they are hard on my industry, I still defend their right to do it. It's no different than than somebody who raises sheep defending the the right of of beef producer, right? Right. You know, it's it's it's, it's a very very similar parallel. Um, so I get asked a lot about this, and and it comes down to a couple of things. Trappers are the uh, the buffer. They are the last bastion between uh, civilization and and uh, and the wild. In Alberta, and I've said this many many times, we ship over forty thousand coyotes every year to the to the auction. The day we weren't there to do it for free, 
is the day the government would be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do it, to pay trappers right. to, to do it. And so we are, we provide a very, very important uh, service. That's, that's one of the, one of the things to do. The other thing we do is that we maintain populations. You know, people don't understand that, that uh, a trapper doesn't go out there and I don't try and whack every Martin on my line. You have unusual situations happen and, and your populations go up and down and you have no control over them. Right now we have voles like, and I don't know if you know what a red back vole looks like. It looks like a big fat short tailed mouse. No, I don't. But yeah, we used to used to be when we were kids. There was two mice. There was a long tailed deer mouse, and and then there was the, what we called a field mouse, and it was actually a vole. But we thought it was a uh, we thought it was a mouse, right? They're very closely related. But right now, the voles are everywhere. I can go out and walk uh, across my uh, my neighbor's field here and kick up ten voles in in a hundred hundred yard walk. So they are skyrocketing. The martin population, the fisher population, are skyrocketing as well. You know, hmm. and because, so, because they're they're just following that population of voles and other rodents. Absolutely, your predator is always followed by two years. Yeah. So when the bunnies are, are are thick, you know, the year that the bunnies peak, two years later the lynx will peak. Mother Nature's not kind. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they so when when they peak two years later and they start to decline, it's not because they they were being retired; it's because they're dying of of disease or of, of starvation or eating one another. So when I saw, talk about uh, trappers uh, maintaining those, those populations, we have the ability to take the surplus. That's all we're trying to do. Yep. On average, uh, mother nature's plan is, is that one out of 10 young born this year is all it, all it needs to make it to next year to continue with a successful population. So 90%, 80 to 90%, uh, you know, are, are nothing more than, than, uh, fodder or, or attempts. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that, that is a surplus that, that would go to waste if a trapper wasn't there to, to, to pick it up, right. To, to keep it, keep it up. And you end up with situations where like trap lines that uh, have not been, been utilized, you know, you end up with these huge misbalances. Nature had no plan. Everybody talks about how man has interfered with the balance of nature. Well, man's been around for a million years or whatever. Um, we're part of the balance, you know. Yep. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, 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 are, we are part of that natural world, even though at times it may not seem like it today. And people want to discount the fact that we've always been part of that natural world. And I always like how... When things are bad, we're lumped in with the bad. But when things are good, we're we're, we're not separated out. And what, what, I, what I'm going to say here is that hunters and fishermen and, and trappers and that are not part of the bad that have been hard on the animal populations. It's the people living in the cities. Yeah. It, 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 it and and all the infrastructure it takes to keep you know those millions of people in LA, you know, uh, fed and housed and and the lights on. The, yep. Those are the things that are hard on on. Uh, wild populations. But when you take uh, a, a uh, trap line that hasn't been trapped for years, and this most recent trap line that I've got, I, uh, when I bought it, it hadn't been trapped for years. The fellow was suffering from dementia and, and uh, hadn't properly trapped it for probably, I don't know, I'm going to say eight, nine years, something like that. And so everybody says, oh my God, it's just going to be loaded with with Martin and it's going to be loaded with, with, with everything, right? What they don't understand is that you can't put game on the shelf. I mean, yeah, you guys know that. Pile it. No, no, you can't set it up on the shelf till you want to bring it down. They tried to do that with moose here in the, in the 80s. They brought in a limited draw and, and they drove the moose population up so high that they're 30% higher than they've ever been. It was a success. The next year, the, the uh, spring moose sticks were so bad, we lost 30% of the population. So guess what the carrying capacity was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what it had been before they started screwing around with it with, their, with, with all their knowledge. So with this, this place that, uh, when I started up with this trap line, all of a sudden it was, and this is typical when in nature is it was predominantly, you know, I mean, there, everything goes through stages. Forest fire goes through, you know, the, 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 the willows and the poplars first spring up and then, then uh, the aspens and then eventually you get to your, your mature pine forest. Right. Yep. But same thing with, with, with animals. They, they go through different stages and stage that my trap line was at after have not having been trapped for, for say 10 years was that we had predominantly old, and apex predators, and they were you know, they, so. My first two years, I never or three years, I never caught a, a kitten lynx. Everything was big, 
big, big links. They were all adults. They were, and I didn't even hardly see kitten tracks because what's happening is, you know, the kittens are born and then they get eight. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're very cannibalistic. I had, uh, the, the first year I, when it came to Fisher, I, you know, I caught Fisher, uh, the first year I think I got 20 Fisher. I was two over what I, I could catch next year. I was nine, 19, one over what I was supposed to catch, but they were all big. They're all adults. I hardly caught a female. They're all, they're all males. And, uh, you know, I would catch 20 Fisher and I caught seven Martin, you know, and, and Martin, of course, are, are, they're all weasel family, yep. but you know, they're, they're smaller and they, every, everything bigger eats them, right? <laughs> <It's just laughs> like the, the coyote eats the fox, the wolf eats yep. the coyote. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Same, same idea. So, I mean, and it, that, that colors their, you know, their whole life. Like, I mean, they won't, when a road gets to be, you know, 30 meters wide, you know, you know 30, 33 yards wide, whatever, uh, a road or a pipeline, or whatever, a Martin no longer crosses that because he's never safe at any point of the day. Owls eat him at night, you know, cats and, and uh, you know, the lynx, the, the, the fisher, um, wolves, coyotes all eat him during the day or whenever they can catch him. So, I mean, that, that, uh, that plays more in, in, into uh, distribution of animals, you know, things like, like development. But I had all of these animals that were old. So what was really going to happen was that, the the population of each one of those populations was going to slowly drop off until there was enough of the old mature animals were gone that successful breeding and, and raising could happen again, you know. And at the same time, you know, you needed to have the the, the population of uh, of the rabbits and the voles and all that to come back up again too. And when I got in there and I started pulling out all these these adult animals, well, within four years now, all of a sudden, you know. I have Martin now. I go from that first year of, of, of catching seven Martin to, you know, I average 35. This year I, I hit 40. And I'm catching them all over. My trap line is 144 square miles. And I caught those that first year that those, those, those seven Martin were all caught down in the very southeast corner of the trap line. Mm-hmm. And that was as far as the spread was. And I had traps everywhere. Like, I mean, I have hundreds everywhere. I mean, I don't do anything by halves, as my wife says. <laughs> 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 so I I I went, I went at it really hard and and I have all of this this I've sat on government boards and all that so I have all these little bit of dangerous knowledge about the, the science and all that and, and I want to know what's going on right mm-hmm. and I watched it and now now the balance that is there I mean I catch you know uh, probably forty percent of of my Martin catch are females uh, wow. you know so that means I've got a great spread of female and the female is a lot smaller so I mean she's than, than the male is, so she's not worth as as much when when it comes time to sell. But it just goes to show where her pecking order is. I mean, there might be even other martins eating her, right? Yep. You know. So, and now I have uh, you know the rabbits are back and the, and the and the lynx are back. Uh, you know, the first year I think I got a dozen lynx, and, and I'm allowed twenty two. And and since then I've been I've been banging off the off the needle on the top of the quote all the, all the time. But now. Last year, I, I saw a, f- a female, and she had nine kittens. Whoa. <laughs> I, 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 had, I had a gun with me, and I could I could have shot them. And you shoot her, and, and the rest of them will stand around. But why? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I was already uh, I was already sitting, I think, in at 17 or 18 links for the year, and it was just cool to watch them, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of happy where I saw them. I didn't have any sets. So. <laughs> yeah. Plus, that's next year's bounty. That's right. The kitten yeah. isn't worth a lot. Yeah. You know, and they, I mean, nature is just the most incredible thing. When you talk about everybody that started out as trappers, I think starting as a trapper makes you a far better hunter because as a trapper, you have to convince that you have to have a conversation with that animal. Yeah. You have to convince it to put its neck through that eight inch noose, or you have to convince it to put its paw on that two inch spot for yep. the, for the foothold that, the, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's having that conversation teaches you so much about animals. And, and another time, or in, in another way, you were out in the bush at a time when the animals are actually at their best. You know, they are actually, they're made for this. Like the fur bearers, they are made for this country and they're made for that, for that weather. And, and it's, it's amazing to watch, you know, the, the, the things that you can learn. Cause it's not a typical time of the year that you're out there. And, and of course here we have lots and lots of snow. So it's like, constantly having somebody doodle in front of you and, and what you can learn from those doodles, right? If you're, if you're, you know, observant, right? Yep. I, I, 
I so enjoy it because you have to have that conversation and convince them when, when it's hunting or fishing, even, I mean, you bow hunting, any of it, you still have that advantage of reach, right? You, you've got some distance there that, that you, that yeah. you can play with, right? Yeah. Even archery, 30, 40 yards. Oh, I can make that shot rifle 300, 400 yards. I can make that shot not Absolutely. with trapping. Nope. Nope. And I, I think that, that that is one of the things that, that makes people understand what's going on. And when you deal with the fur bearers, you know, because I mean, all the fur bearers are, are carnivores, you know, other than yep. other than muskrat and and, uh, and beaver, beaver, you know, everything yeah. else is, is a carnivore and they eat stuff. And you see that interaction, like, I mean, when you watch, you know, um, lynx, like a lot of people don't understand the, you know, how, how cannibalistic lynx are. And, yeah. you know, you you uh, have a set there, and and um, it's funny. <laughs> this happened again last winter, but I had I have a set, a pen there, and you know you've got your either your your rub uh, rub lure in there, or you you might have a, a half of a, a lynx hanging there, or half of a, a of a beaver, or whatever, and then you have. Um, sticks that usually is all it takes to to make a pen for a lynx, and and they they'll walk around it, and then they come to the spot where you have have the the snare and it's open and then you shove their head and walk in and walk in and you got them. But, you know, I always have multiple snares there, not just the, the one I oftentimes I'll have one to the front and one to the back of the, of this little loose circle, three foot in diameter of, of sticks that have stuck up right in the, in the snow. And, and they're just literally twigs, but links are lazy and they're curious. So they walk around it. You know, this is stuff you learn from them, right? Right. They walk around it looking in and they come to the point where you've got this V of, of two smooth sticks. Like your other sticks will be um, what you get from underneath a, a, a spruce, you know, those dry, furry, hairy things, you know? Yep. And, and, and he doesn't like that touching his face or that stick because it'll stick to his fur, that kind of stuff. So where you put your snares, you have these two smooth sticks, and he don't that don't bother him at all. You leave him a couple inches apart at the bottom, because he's going to lead with his foot, right? So yep. as he as he puts his foot over top through that V and, and sets it inside the pen, his head is right above that foot. So now you've 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 targeted everything, right? And so yep. he sticks his head in, and boom, the, the the snare falls falls on his neck, and and you've got him. Now, with lynx, I mean, if that's the mother that does that, uh, oftentimes the kitten's eater, and yeah. and and just because I don't know whether it's whether they're that's just funny. naturally. Well, I think part of it starts out, you know, I mean, they groom one another all the time, right? Yeah, you know, cats groom one another all the time. Maybe it starts out as grooming, and it's like, well, I'm hungry. Hmm, this doesn't taste so bad, you know. Yeah. Mom, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, or or just they get eaten at it right away. They don't have a lot of time because lynx can't eat frozen meat. So really? I didn't you, know that. No, they don't have the jaw structure, and yet they can they can break the leg bones. And that, mind you, the leg bone on a on a lynx is pretty is pretty light because yeah. they are a, a light animal. But no, they they if the meat freezes on them, if they can't eat and eat it all up in one sitting, and the meat freezes on them, sometimes they will lay on it to thaw it to eat it. Huh. I didn't it, know that. Huh. It, it, but this is the stuff you learn, right? Yeah. This is the, this is the kind of connection that you make with with the wild that you just you'd never know otherwise, right? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you you've you've talked about, and I just want to interject it to make sure that the U.S. audience who is listening to this understands how it works in Canada, is that in Canada you kind of get a trap line you you get assigned or how would i say it do you have actual ownership of a trap yep. line is it something you're yes. licensed you buy i i'm not sure exactly how you acquire it but once you acquire it you have this geographic area but it also comes with a certain expectation like you were saying oh i'm supposed to you know the the expectation is i'll catch 20 fisher well i caught 22 it's not like you caught 22, so you're going to jail. It's just this is what your trap line is expected and how it works. And and because you have quasi-ownership of it, you take care of that. You try to manage that. You try to make it as productive as you possibly can, not just this year, but for all the future years. Am I saying that right? You are. Uh, trap lines in Alberta are bought and sold. Okay. Uh, the average trap line in Alberta is two townships. 
that's the average size. Some so, up far, far north. For, oh, do you know what a township is? Yeah. So for the listener, a township here in the United States, you'll see these maps that are one mile by one mile is a section. And then a township is six sections by six sections. So it's 36 square miles. Correct. So two townships would be 72 square miles. Yes. Yep. My, and mine is four townships. My, okay. I, I, actually, it's kind of handy because it's perfectly square. I have four perf- I have four complete townships, and it's good for a simple guy like me. <laughs> <laughs> 12 miles by 12 miles. Yes. Yeah. So it's 144 square miles. I have exclusive rights to the trapping there. You buy them. The All of Alberta was, and most of Canada was uh, is the same way. Uh, provinces, just like your states, control the trapping. So I believe every province has registered trapline system, which is what this is. We call them RFMAs, Registered Fur Management Area. Okay. So my registered trapline is, is uh, 12 by 12, and I have exclusive rights to it. I bought it from a fellow. And uh, they were first divided up into trap lines, I believe, in 1925. That's when it started, the, the, the licensed, uh, for, uh, registered fur for trapping areas started was in 25. We also have, and, and all, the other thing to remember is these registered lines are all on public land. Okay. Yep. In Canada, we call it crown land. Down there, you guys call it, I guess, public or state land, or I'm yep. not sure. Public land. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they're all in, all in public land. We also can trap on private land. Uh, in Alberta, you need to have that trapping um, permission in writing, and you have to. It has to have, have a special check off of, uh, by the landowner if you're using uh, lethal snares because uh, hmm. they're they're permanent for dogs too. Anyway, yeah. uh, so we ha- there are two different licenses that you can have in Alberta, and. The nice thing about that, and this was one of the very first pushbacks that I got when I started the show, was people says, you're telling all the stories. And I says, you know, you're, you're all these secrets. I says, well, it doesn't matter. You're never going to trap my line, and I'm never going to trap your line. And then I started to discover, like, I, the, the free-for-all that it was down south, you know, that, you know, if people don't respect what's going on, you, you might have six trappers setting a, a mink trap under the same bridge, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Okay. So our the whole idea behind them doing trap lines in in Alberta was that it could you we could actually control the uh, the harvest and we we had some ideas and the whole, when they started with it back in twenty five it was genius actually and and what they've done with it to, to this point in time is ridiculous you know really? like they had. Well, they uh, to have the foresight to have all this information at your fingertips that you could collect all this information from these different uh, registered trap lines and all this kind of stuff, and it would help in the planning and all that. And now we get to you know twenty twenty and and TikTok and every phone, and and none of this information has ever been correlated or used. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. So you yeah, have to it's, report. It's, do you have to report everything? That, okay, yes. here's here's what I ended up. Here's how many marten, fisher, beaver, muskrat, yep. wolves, coyotes, red fox, lynx, blah, blah, blah. And on top of that, we have four animals in, in my trap line, four animals that are quota animals, which means they, the quota is for the maximum I can take. So okay. fisher are quota, uh, lynx are quota, uh, river otter, and wolverine. Okay. And there are some places like in Ontario, they have a beaver quota attached to each trap line and you have to get 75% of your quota in order to keep your line. Whew. So, so yeah, even if li- the price is in the tank, you got to go out and catch, say your quota is 80, you got to go catch 60 of them to keep your trap line. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, the upside of it is, is, is right now casters worth a lot, but like most things, right. the, the Western casters worth the most. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Everybody gets to be poking fun at these. <laughs> that, that, that's the same in Canada as it is in the States then. You guys in Alberta make fun of the folks in Quebec. Well, we don't make fun of them, and, and it's not usually Quebec so much, it's just east. It's a general thing. Yeah, it, general, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a right. vague thing. It's, when yeah. we don't get our pipelines to you know to, to the east coast and that, then we do make fun of, uh, of Quebec or, 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 or people threaten to do worse, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, in the States, if you live in the Rockies, you just kind of blame everything on people who live on the east coast or west coast. So, sim- pretty similar. Yeah. You know, and here, here in Montana, if it's a bad day of weather... It seems like everyone just blames the poor folks from California. 
You know, <laughs> if, if it's too hot, uh, blame those folks from California. So <laughs> kind of the same thing, it sounds like. <laughs> we, we, but you guys are kind of have a, there's a, a bit of a, a wave going on. People leaving California and headed for places like Montana. Yeah, I know. We, we, we tried to close the gates, but uh, it, was, it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> I mean, I moved here 30 years ago. I tried to close the gate behind me, but I must not have locked it. I might have closed it, but I didn't lock it, evidently. So, but yeah. hey, I, I just, uh, the reason I, I interjected that about uh, how it works in Canada is you guys make the trapper, and by, by kind of doing it this way, the trapper really has a vested interest in the long term management of that territory. Oh yeah, and that's the that was another part of of the success that PETA had was they turned us all into these bloodthirsty killers and that. And here in Canada, I mean, we have all have controlled seasons for for uh, coyotes and everything. Everything has a season for trapping. There are some things like beavers and coyotes that can be shot on private land any time of the year, but not trapped. You know, there's still a mm-hmm. season for trapping. So when PETA would take and, and put out, you know, about this coyote with her f- foot in a foothold and and how about how her young were starving to death in the, in the den waiting to come back that's absolutely false that is just the biggest load of horse horse pucky ever because we don't have seasons then you know right. our season our seasons for for coyotes ends february 28th the young aren't born for months at that point right you know but so but, I'm, that, I'm, but that, that doesn't make a very good story rich if you're trying to convince people to hate trapping you know you got to kind of twist it and and paint a reality or paint a picture that is not the reality. And this is why I'm glad you're doing this platform called trapping, because I believe if, if you don't tell your own story, someone's going to tell it for you. And the way that someone, the way someone else tells your story is usually not beneficial to you. So having Richard Mellon out there showing trapping all its values, it's, uh, you know, the way it happens is so valuable because, like you're saying, these groups that are against any use of animals for food or anything, they're out there with all their money and resources and platforms trying to tell your story in a way that is nothing but a an emotional fiction. And you're out there saying, here's the reality. And that's why I love, as much as I'm not, I don't watch a lot of TV, I do kind of like the fact that a lot of these shows in Alaska show trapping, show hunt, subsistence hunting or whatever, because a lot of more urban America is watching those kind of shows. And I'd rather them get the message from whatever, some, I don't even know the name of some of those shows. I'd rather have them get a message about the wild places, even as artificial as and contrived as it might be from (laughs) those type of platforms than what they're probably going to get spoon fed from whatever group they might donate to out of the goodness of their heart. They think they're doing something helpful, but they don't see this whole picture that you are able to paint by creating a platform that's based on trapping. Well, I've always looked at it like this. The best disinfectant in the world is sunshine. And if if the truth <laughs> and the facts <laughs> if the truth and the facts can't lay out there in the sun for everybody to view, then there is something wrong that needs to be changed. So that's all yeah. we're doing. We're showing the truth and the facts. Yeah. You know? Uh, you, you talk about um those those shows up north. I just one comment, and, and that's I, I wish I could catch a four hundred dollar beaver. <laughs> yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> uh, yeah, four hundred dollar beaver, huh? Never heard of one, but yeah. on TV, there's there is uh, the problem with emotion, though, and most people are kind hearted. Yep. You know, like I mean, I I I watch baby wild animals all the time. I'm I'm watching a, a, a doe and fawn out, out, out to the window of my office at, the, at this moment. Uh, I'm not cr- a cruel, heartless person by any means. But what happens is that emotion gets used, and it gets used to fund stuff and, and to raise money. Did you watch Tiger King? No. 
Okay. I, 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 I'm just They're, that busy. I, I see all these Facebook the kind of me. What do they call it? Me yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The I have meme, no yeah. idea what that is. I asked my wife about a month ago. I'm like, what is all this stuff? She's like, I don't know. It looks like the dude needs a haircut, man. <laughs> so, well, there's, two, there's two two sides to the story. The one side's the Tiger King and he raises tigers and and they they only they're only useful for petting and that for uh, to a certain age and then they have to do something with them and they so they get sold up. I guess there are more tigers in captivity in the United States than there are in the rest of the world. Probably. Like, yeah, even including in the wild. Anyway, the other side from the Tiger King is Carol Baskins. And you've seen memes with, about Carol Baskins. And she has um, a tiger rescue, which is basically the, the same thing that the Tiger King has that he calls a zoo. She calls a tiger rescue. They both charge money for people to go, go in and see. And that, but she has people so bought into that she is pure and sweet that they have to volunteer for, they, they, none of them, none of the people that work work there get paid. They have to volunteer for two years before they get a name tag, you know. And and people do this. And some people have been volunteer for five, seven, five, six, seven years. And she has this YouTube site that gets millions of views every day. And 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 it's you know stuff that just makes me gag. You know how how, all, how are you all today? All my cats and kitties. And this is what's going on. And and uh-huh. you know this 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 cat uh, ate a bone and is having trouble pooping. And you know the, this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and people connect with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and that's the problem. That, that that's the whole problem with emotion is that is that it is so emotion generally is a good deal, but it, today's ability to manufacture and and manipulate emotion is is unprecedented. And, you know, social media is, is unprecedented in that area. And we're ending up with a lot of people who, who are just terribly confused. And so when they get confused, they just, you know, go with what feels good. And, and that emotion yep. is what feels good. Yeah. Well, I, I, that, that's part of why I wanted you on this podcast is because the, of all the people I know, and I, I know a lot of really good trappers, there's also, the, if we're going to tell this story, we need good storytellers. So we got to have a good story and a good storyteller. And I can tell the whole world with a hundred percent confidence that Richard Mellon is at the right at the top of that list of three or four best storytellers I've ever sat around and hung out with. You, I, I mean, both in terms of how you tell a story in person, but your ability to communicate with media. And I know you aren't doing this, even though Sandy might roll her eyes when you say you might have been picking for a fight. I know this <laughs> This is also your passion, Rich. You, Absolutely, you, it's my you passion. You truly love trapping and the fact that it's been one of your lifetime pursuits. It's It's been my life. It's not even like a pursuit. I mean, this we were raised doing this stuff. And this was the part, I think... And you've seen this within the, the the hunting TV show industry. There are people that get into it because it's a business and to make money, right? Yep. And that's their whole focus behind their, their show. For me, my whole focus was to try and tell the truth. I just wanted people to know what the truth about trapping was. And had I went at it from the other point of view where it was a business, I'd, I'd probably, I know I'd been more successful uh, as far <laughs> fiscally, but I, I'm, I wouldn't... Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be as true to what's going on. And, and I'm just, it, it's just important it, yeah. it, to me. It's, it's so important to be able to spread the truth and, and, and show people. I, I have met so many people, you know, uh, the thing that I like the most, and I think this is the part that the pollsters and, and the media and that gets wrong is that the silent majority out there is just like you and me, Randy. And that's how president Trump got elected. You know, that's the, you know, that's how, how, Things like hunting and fishing and that still still are allowed to take place is because for most people, as long as there's an explanation and as long as it's not what they what they're being told, like with trapping and that, they're okay with it. I mean, we have millions of people watching on Amazon Prime and YouTube and and uh, our new community and and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. The negativity is minor. The Very vast minor. majority. Yeah, the vast majority are, are, it is so cool, you know, and I don't trap. Do you know how many, how many, I, I could show you the, the emails I've, I've gotten this last, even this last week. And I, I'll bet you that one of them's from a trapper and the other 90 are from people who don't trap. 
and they're yep. just fascinated about the life. And that fascination has has actually picked up a lot with uh, with this virus thing, where people, you know, people start worrying about, uh, you know, the security of the food chain. Uh, yep. You know, how, I, I'm sure you're seeing that a lot in in the hunting, right? Huge, huge. Yeah, people people are start worrying about it, and the, the people are taking up hunting, and and. and it's the same thing. Like people are, are 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 taking up trapping, and the and God bless their hearts. So many of them have young kids, and yep. you know, they, I get all these pictures sent to me. They they're, they're taking their kids out. They're teaching them away. Will a kid grow up to be a trapper? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but he's going to grow up understanding nature and and our place and the animals' places in nature, and and that's a big thing because today we're you could you could do a walk down most you know, uh, streets of most cities and, and you could have just as many people believe that chocolate milk came from brown cows as, as white milk came from white cows. <laughs> hey, <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, our, our universities aren't much better than yours. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, you, what you're talking about is just this disconnection that we have from the natural world. And, and that for, frightened me. For, that for frightened me, me. There, my first connection to the natural world was, was trapping. And probably my m- most, uh, I don't know if you want to call it, the, the best teacher to me of the natural world was trapping. Yeah. And yeah. Those, those are just undeniable facts. I can, I, I, I might have people who listen to the podcast and say, I didn't know you're a trapper, man. I'm, I'm gone. I'm unsubscribing. And, and if that's the case, that's the case, you know. But the truth of, of who I am and where I come from came from weasels and mink and muskrat and beaver and, and, uh, you know, whatever it was that existed in my little part of the planet there that was within walking distance. Because when I was eight years old, I didn't have a snowmobile or an, an ATV. Uh, but I had a whole bunch of weasel traps and then I could walk down to the river and I'd have a few mink traps and I, you know, whatever it is. And so I, I interject all that because uh, on my media platforms, every winter, every spring, I do some muskrat trapping episodes. And when I talk about how we as humans here, here in Montana, I, I always use the example before we got here and you know, started building cities and roads and highways and dams and everything else. The, the dispersal of muskrats across our valley was far more natural. It it was, they were dispersed so that the densities didn't get artificially high. Well, now here come cities and roads and highways. And now the muskrats are, when, when it freezes over, they come to our spring creeks and the few spring creeks that aren't developed that are still in their natural phase get densities of muskrats that are so ridiculous it's destroying the banks of the spring creek so i talk about that i show you see where all this erosion is happening these are these little muskrats sitting right at the water line digging underneath and eating the roots from the bottom and if you have 300 of them in this 1 mile stretch all eating on the bank for 3 months out of the year guess what? You got a lot of erosion. And when the erosion happens, you get siltation in the spring creek, the water temperatures warm up, the fish don't have habitat, the water fall, you know, you go through that whole process. And I I don't know that I've ever had one negative comment on those muskrat trapping episodes. The, I guess as humans, we, we, we tend to be very egotistical. Okay, we tend mm-hmm. to think that we are responsible for so much, and all it is is that our timelines uh, are so short, so brief. When, when you talk about the Earth and and nature and all that, it's over the millennia. So there will have been times in in uh, Montana when the, you know the same situation happened by by something causing causing those those muskrats to be pushed in, just into the spring creeks and then and you know they eventually ended up silting in and killing out the fish and uh, and all that stuff and then and then rebirth happened after that and it, it started all over again but yep. you know mother nature does that over hundreds of thousands or millions of years and we we look at a little 10 you know a decade 10 <laughs> a 10 year window and and like we're responsible for it right 
Like, oh my God. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's all about balance. And, and I try and talk to people about balance and, and I try to talk to them. You know, there, there are a lot of people that I, uh, I've talked to and, you know, if I can get them to a neutral spot on trapping, I'm happy. Yeah. And there are some people that say, okay, I understand why you do it. And I understand why it's necessary. I still don't like it. I, okay. I'm fine with that. You know, but I, I have yet to, to take a, um, a tan lynx uh, pelt off the, off the wall and hold it out to a lady and they touch it and them them not just absolutely love it. Or that, you know, I had um, a sheared beaver uh, blanket made for, for our bed uh, for Sandy and it's made out of uh, 20 uh, beaver pelts that were, were plucked and sheared. Well, that is like half inch thick crushed velvet. It is the softest, yep. most gorgeous, you know, and that's the, that's her blanket. And there's never been a lady that looked at that and, and couldn't appreciate it. But they're, they're looking at a finished product. They're not looking at it sitting there on its tail eating uh, bark, right? Yep. Uh, people have that problem with, you know, you know, the, the lamb springing across the, the, the front yard and, 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 and the lamb chop on your plate. They, you know, they, a lot of people don't want to face that. Well, I'm okay with that. I'm yeah. okay. We're, we're all meat eaters in that because I choose to shoot my own meat or you choose to shoot, kill your own meat. Don't judge us for that. Somebody has to kill yours too. Yep. You know, and, and usually when I, when I talk to people in those kind of situations and, and talk using the, those, those arguments, they understand it. Yeah. They understand it. But people, once again, they're being emotional or mm-hmm. and they're putting themselves there facing that animal in the trap or, you know, squeezing the trigger of that rifle on the elk, right? And they, yep. they can't do it, you know? And they don't know whether they can or can't, but in their mind at that moment, they can't do it, you know? It, well, it, it's, it's not, th- that's where each of us, I think, who are in outdoor pursuits, we take the responsibility for whatever it is that is provided to us. And that is a difficult reconciliation to have when you see that white-tailed deer that is going to be your meal, all of a sudden its eyes go from its really sparkling brown to that bluish green. Yeah. Well, guess guess what? Yep. That's that is a wild thing being converted to food when you see that happening. And I I don't care who you are. You are always affected by that in some ways. When I shot my first few deer, I was affected by it as a teenager where I'd walk over behind the grove of trees and shed a few tears while dad took care of it. And now it's still a powerful reconciliation. And it gives me this gratitude, this thankfulness, and this commitment that I want to make sure that there are white-tailed deer next year and next year and next generation and the next generation. And I understand that some people don't want to have to reconcile those difficult emotions. I so do. here's the question. Here, here's the question I want to ask you. I get asked this this, this too. I want I want your answer on this. Sure. When you shed, shed, shed your tears over, over killing that first whitetail, how could you do it again? Uh, because the next 20 meals that my family had were that deer and we celebrated that deer and we celebrated everything of the whole wild landscape that it represents. And so that's what brought me out the next year is this understanding that that was food. It was the understanding that whether I shoot that deer or whether someone went over to the neighbor and, and said hey can i buy some chickens from you and you you a chicken ended up on your plate something still died so that i could live and i want i want that honest relationship that connects me to what life did that deer have what life did that grouse have and how do i make sure that those lives stay there that this landscape, these these productive lands and waters will continue to do that because that's where I want my food to come from. So I'm vested in this entire equation. I'm and very, it, very similar to you in the in the fact that I take it as my responsibility. I take mm-hmm. it as my responsibility to to maintain the animals, to uh, maintain the populations, to kill as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that an animal that I get, whether it's a deer that I get to eat or, or it's Martin that I I get to skin and, and, uh, and put up in that, I like to think that it, 
it's not it's being respected more than than what nature had in mind for it because nature's awful nature's ugly if you want to talk about wolves i'll talk to, talk to you about wolves here in a minute <laughs> and 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 the, the fact that Nothing ever goes to waste in nature, not not nope. for a second. Nothing goes to waste. But I think that it's put to a better use going through my hands. And, that, and to me, that's, it may sound cheesy, but that's an honor. And it's an honor that I take responsibility, you know, I take it very seriously. Yeah. I, and, and this is where, as we urbanize, I can't believe how big Calgary's got. I drove through oh. Calgary last year and I hadn't been there since, what year did the, were the flames in the Stanley Cup? Uh, 2004 or five, something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd been like 15 years since I drove through Calgary. I'm like, wow, looks to me like Alberta's got the same urbanization sprawl problem that the rest of the United States is experiencing. Uh, but when I go there and I see how urbanized we've become as a society, I understand the disconnectedness that people are not connected to growing their own food or catching their own food or shooting their own food or, or, you know, trapping something that is their livelihood and becomes a surplus that they can convert to some sort of income stream or the clothing, the, the, all that. And so I try to understand, all right, if I grew up in the city and it's been four generations since anyone in my family has traveled outside the subway route what would my perspective of wild places and wild things be would i understand that the salad that i ate last night was grown because we dewatered the central valley of california and with it went the tule elk habitat the waterfowl habitat that everything else no that's right I i wouldn't make that connection but that's We're, that's the whole problem is that we get blamed. It's always right. us direct consumers that get blamed <laughs> when it would when we had nothing to do with draining that so that they could grow lettuce and, and the tule elk were gone. We wanted the tule elk to stay there, right? You know, I mean, yep. but but they always they always pick us us direct consumers, and it's going on right now. Whether it's with, with, with the stupid new gun control stuff that the liberal government in Canada's got going on here, I mean, he's attacking mm-hmm. the registered gun owners. We've right. already jumped through the, the hoops nine times in and in, in order to own that gun and it's registered and everything. But he's he's going to take some of them away, you know. Like I mean, yeah. what kind of sense does that make? We aren't the people c- committing the the crime, and it's the same thing. Well, <laughs> it is. No, you're exactly right. Don't get me going on politics. No, but, well, <laughs> we'll stay away from politics. But to that issue, Rich, that that's a classic example of somebody completely disconnected from the reality of it wants to be able to say, oh, I did something. And boy, I really feel good. That's, uh, Virtue, Virtue signal is just, it, yeah. you know, I, 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 read, I read the other day that now that um, the mayor of, of New York had 27 cops guarding the, the mural in front of the Trump Tower on the, uh, and, you know, and yet crime is skyrocketing because they, 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 they're defunding the police. I mean, that, you know, the, the virtue signal was more important than, than actually protecting people. But you talk about the size of Calgary. Um, between mm-hmm. Evan and Calgary, we have four million people in in Alberta now, and four Evan and million? Calgary, yes, between Evan and Calgary, the, it is over half of them, and wow. we're starting to see that total disconnect. Like Edmonton has become a little socialist cent- central. Like they they vote uh, Edmonton, of course, is where the seat of the government is, and and uh, most uh, of the, the people there, a lot of the people there, are employed by the government, that that kind of stuff, and and but they they vote very socialist, and and they. Uh, and all that means that they, they never leave the city. When, a couple of years ago, we were, we were um, dealing with a new PR firm in Calgary, and we were doing the, the sportsman shows in, in Evan and Calgary. So the first one goes off at Calgary, and, and we're dealing with this PR firm. And, and uh, we had to keep, always had to go down, drive down on onto 17th uh, Street to to meet with these people at their office and that. And, and it was like, well, why don't you guys just meet us up here on the far end? They didn't even have vehicles. They lived their entire life on 17th in uh, what was called the Red Mile when 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 Calgary was making the run at the at the uh, playoffs. Uh, yeah. They they lived their whole life there. They didn't even own vehicles. So hmm. when they had to travel to Edmonton to come do this at Edmonton, they, they traveled on the bus, you know, and it was. Oh. And it was it, to me the whole idea that somebody actually lived in Alberta that didn't own a vehicle. It was like, 
Oh, let's get rid of them. We, we don't want them breeding, do we? <laughs> Send them back to Toronto or Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, that was. You know, and I didn't realize that, that 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 we'd had that kind of disconnect. And so, when you see people that live their whole lives in places like that, they've never driven a vehicle. You know, the right. one didn't even have a driver's license. So, what do you expect that they're going to understand about hunting and fishing? And this was our PR firm for a hunting and fishing show. <laughs> huh. Huh. Well, I, I I think we we can if we kind of looked at it in degrees, the disconnectedness to foraging and gardening is not that great. A lot of people can still go grow a little plant of tomatoes on, on the balcony of their high rise apartment. Then you get to fishing. Well, a lot of people, I, I still don't understand why we, and maybe I understand, but I don't accept it, is why do people have a different feeling about killing a fish to eat it versus killing a deer to eat it or a rabbit? I, that's, mm. so, so we kind of have these degrees of separation uh, that I, 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 or, I don't know if separation, or disconnect to that food source. And it kind of goes from gardening and foraging. Okay. Fishing is a little further disconnect. Hunting is even a further disconnect. And then trapping is like, oh, you know, that the, the Hudson Bay company, well, they came over in 1600, <laughs> uh, you know, da, da, da. Why, why are we still trapping today? Well, because it's, it's still required. It's it, because it's yeah. still re- required. Uh, you want to talk about, about wolves and why, why trapping is required? Uh, we can, you know, we can talk about wolves until then. We, or do we need to do a different podcast? Or, or do you do you have three more hours on your hand? <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be editing, so I'm I, I'm playing hooky right at the moment. <laughs> okay, let's talk about wolves. I, I'll, I'll give you just some some hard facts that, that, that we have in Alberta. Uh, we have, you know, somewhere they, they say between seven, seven to 80, 7,000 to 8,500 wolves in Alberta, which is mm-hmm. many times more than what it should be. Uh, in, in important uh, caribou and wolf habitat, we're ending up with uh, 11 wolves per a thousand square kilometers. When, the, when the density f- to do damage to an uh, ungulate population should be about 6.5 or six and a half wolves to the thousand square kilometers. So we're just about double the number of wolves it takes to herd a population. Okay. And if you take a look at, uh, at those, if you take that bottom number of, of 7,000 wolves uh, and say that we have 7,000 wolves, well, it, it takes, um, let me take a look at my, it takes 350,000 ungulates to produce yep. the 52,000 f- uh, food animals j- just to feed those 7,000 wolves. That's not including any of the, any of the ungulates that are getting hit by vehicles, that, not, right. not including uh, any use by hunters or, or, or natives or, or any of that stuff. That is just to feed the wolves. 350,000 ungulates every year, moose, deer, elk, to, uh, to, to produce 52,000 food animals for, for them. It, yeah. It's just, it's, it's astounding. And, and people look, look at me and, and say, but, oh, but, you know, the wolf is, you know, there's, they're free, they're beautiful, they're, they're wild, you know, they, they hamstring it, then they cut its throat. No, no. Wolves <laughs> just about never hamstring. That's just another load of horse, horse hockey. Wolf, <laughs> you know how wolves kill a moose? And no, how do they how do they take down a moose and and a, and a pack of wolves will, will, will have to kill uh at, at least um you know like the average pack of uh, of eight wolves will, will have to kill a, a, a moose every every three to five days depending on on how cold it is because their their uh, right. energy but demands go up with, with the cold right yep. and but every three to five days they kill a moose and how they do it is is uh once they get close enough to make, make the rush or whatever one at a time they they will jump and they will latch their teeth into the buttocks on the back okay yep. couple things this does one it increases the amount of weight that that moose is trying to carry now and the wolf can can tuck itself up and and hang hang there ripping ripping open the the hide and the meat as the as the uh, moose runs and not get kicked. Okay, yep. pretty quickly there's two three wolves hanging off back there, and of yep. course uh, you know they rip it open and, and blood loss start starts happening. Eventually the moose will, will will run out of air. And I've watched all of this. I've watched it real time, uh, and I've and I've I've watched and walked through the the snow and and 
you know, the shrapnel field of moose and that, you know, over a kilometer, you know, the, these, these will take place. So once they've got enough uh, hanging off it, now the, the moose is winded and he, and he, so he stand there with the head down. Then you have another one that grabs it by the nose. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that one gets flung around pretty good. It's usually a, a young, a, a two year old um, <laughs> or, or three year old and they get, they get flung around. You know, they, they don't, they bounce better. They don't break so, so, so easy. So now you've got wolves hanging off the back and you've got wolves hanging off the front. Eventually it collapses and falls over. The second that moose quits trying to get up, they start eating. Right. Wol- yeah. They wolves eat them a lot. Yep, wolves kill by blood loss and blood loss alone. No different than you and I, except we do it do it much kinder. We, you know, we we shoot yeah. through the lungs or the heart or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, w- w- when you think about that, you know, there is there is nothing. Everybody talks about oh, the majestic wolf and all, and all I can think about is is, is how for the last hundred yards, you know, the the, the moose is is tripping over its own entrails. Is like I can see it in the snow, right? Yeah, you know. Uh, they're, they're, there's, they're animals. They right. are no better, no worse. I mean, we, we, we take and give all of these, uh, these various uh, feelings and, and emotions and that to, to, to these animals that, that, that they don't understand or, or don't deserve. You know, we you humanize them, the Disney yeah. factor, right? Yeah. Wolves, wolves are, uh, wolves are wolves. I, yeah. you know, that I, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's aired three times now. Uh, I was on 60 Minutes talking about wolves, and the comment that everybody clings to, and, and that's the, you know, when you subject yourself to some other media platform, and they're going to do a 20-minute segment on something, you know you're at their mercy. So you you kind of gauge what you're saying and how you're saying it, because it's like, I don't want them to use this against me. Yeah. But, I, I say this thing that you know what, contrary to the or to the disappointment of some, contrary to popular belief, wolves are wolves. They don't have rainbows shooting out their asses. Uh, <laughs> you said that on sixty minutes. <laughs> I did. But here's how it happened, Rich. So there's a researcher I know who has been doing all kinds of wolf research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And he's very matter of fact about wolves that, you know, wolves are wolves. They they aren't the the savior. They aren't the, you know, the little red riding hood isn't a reality any more than wolves being the, the savior to the planet is not the reality. And so... In National Geographic magazine, he was quoted as saying, you know, uh, some people are disappointed when they find out that wolves don't have rainbows shooting out their asses. (laughs) (laughs) And so how I got attributed that quote on 60 Minutes is I had told their researchers about this this, uh, person I know who they've been doing all this study and here's his opinion. You know, he, he probably knows more about wolves in the greater Yellowstone area than the, you know, he'd be in the top four people you'd pick to talk about this. And uh, so when I told them he's been quoted as saying this, they're like, Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. That, that is so profound and so funny. So, so they have me say it about six different ways in front of the camera. And as, as they're wrapping up the interview, I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that one's going to make the cut. But <laughs> that's a side story to saying, you know what? Wolves are wolves. They, yeah. they are not saving. They, they don't walk up to the elk or the moose and say, hey, you know, we got a deal here, right? You're going to lay down. You're going to you're going to die here in the next half hour. And then we're going to eat you. Oh, they, I have their. There's not that equation going on out there. It's exactly what you say. And it's funny because I, I just spent a whole bunch of time espousing of emotion, emotion, emotion. And I don't know how many times I have walked up on an animal. I remember one calf moose, and I mean, it is just, it is half bones, right? And I looked down at it, and I, I kind of push the, the front hoof with my foot, and it its eyeball opens up, and it looks at me. And I was like, I was just, oh yeah, it was just, it was horrifying. Like, I mean, the reaction I had was just like, I, I couldn't believe. Well, I, I, I instantly shot it. I mean, it was hunting season. Uh, you know, I had a yeah. gun with me. It was late in November, and then I then I set up a, a wolf bait around there. And I, I, as much as I talked about emotion and all, I, I took on, on unholy glee with every wolf I hung uh, around that kill. You know, yeah. like. 
and it's and it's stupid because I mean I was I was just as big a victim of, of, of the emotion as as the person who's against me being the trapper, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's hard at times. I mean, we see some really brutal stuff out in the natural world. We we oh. see the wolves do what they do, or we see the the golden eagle standing on the back of the antelope fawn eating it alive. While the yep. antelope on struggles to to keep up with its mom, we yep. we we see whatever it might be, and it's hard not to have an, an initial emotional response to that. But you know, the golden eagle—that's what golden eagles have been doing for the last, you know, since <laughs> since time yep. began, and. They don't get to walk up to that antelope and say, "Hey, I got a tag this year, uh, so you, you know I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna eat you. you, yeah. <laughs> you would you would you please die real quickly and humanely so that I can eat you and not feel guilty about it? They they can't enter into that discussion, and so it, we get to see those things, and it does. I'll, I'll, I know it affects me. I've seen some stuff. I'm like, oh man, that was painful to watch. Like I've, I've seen a pair of coyotes tear into a red fox, and that red yep. fox la- lasted about three minutes, maybe if that. Not even that. It probably seemed longer than it was. But when those coyotes caught that red fox, that red yep. fox didn't stand a chance, and it was just. You know, canines have this territorial hierarchy. And guess what? You aren't coming here hunting our rabbits and eating our mice. Uh, we're going to get rid of you, Mr. Red Fox. And oh, by the way, we'll eat you, eat a bit of you too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just I, how I, it is. Back east, everybody talks about the koi wolves, the koi wolves, how the coyotes and the wolves breed together and all that. My version of a koi wolf out on the trap line is is it uh, a wolf turd with, with coyote hair in it. <laughs> <laughs> and you see a lot of that. I do. You know, I do. I mean, here here's the other thing. You know, we uh, where we're at here around the greater Yellowstone region, we have a grizzly bear population that is bursting at the seams. This spring... You know, just with hikers and bikers and antler, shed antler collectors, we've had multiple attacks. And the everyone thinks that somehow these grizzly bears, if we don't manage them, they're going to continue to expand and expand and expand. And they don't. What happens is infanticide, which yep. is the polite way of saying the old boar grizzly comes and kills the female's cubs. That happened. That's if you talk to most of the researchers, if you go for the first year of a grizzly bear's cub cub's life in the greater Yellowstone region, their greatest risk isn't a human, it's an adult boar grizzly bear. Absolutely. And people don't want they don't want to hear that. That's that's that doesn't fit the narrative of oh the grizzly bears live in this harmonious everybody get along hold hands and sing kumbaya. Exactly. I was gonna, you, you took that word out of my mouth kumbaya the Disney thing. Yeah, what? It, it, so when you tell people that is what's happening on this natural landscape because it's out of sight and out of it can be, then be out of mind. They're comforted by saying, oh, I don't I don't know that I believe that. Well, <laughs> that's what's happening to most of these grizzly cubs. And so if you think somehow that the big old boar grizzlies are going to quit doing that because they want to see a larger population of grizzly bears spread throughout the Rocky Mountains, that ain't going to happen. Old Papa Same. Bear... <laughs> He's going to keep doing what every Papa Bear has done since time began. Well, I, I have spent an, an enormous amount of time uh, watching, like hunting bears, and uh, some of the stuff that you run into is just. I watched, and it wasn't even you know the sow was a little sow. She's only maybe a couple, couple two, three years old, so she was small, but she had three cubs, black bears, mm-hmm. and um, the the boar that came in was not much bigger than her. But he killed and ate each one of her her cubs, even climbed up the tree and and got the, she couldn't fight him off. And I can still 
hear the screaming and shrieking going on in my mind. And that, that that's from a dozen years ago. But here was, you know, a lot of people have the idea, well, okay, well, wolves eat moose. You know, that's that's understandable. But wolves eat wolves too. You know, yeah. <laughs> if, if, if the wrong, if the wrong uh, 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 female gets bred and she has pups, her pups will more likely get eight. I, yep. I watched um, a wolf going down a, uh, a cut line here. It would, would have been last summer. And she's going down this, this, this seismic line and I get on her with a pair of binoculars, you know, and it, it was early June or whatever. I was like, what the heck is she packing? Right. And I, and I realized that, oh, there's tails, there's a tail hanging there. And then look, and it's like half the body of a, a of a, a wolf cub and the other half's eight, you know? So wow. still, that was, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, that's just nature, uh, you know? And I mean, it's, it's pretty brutal. Uh, as you pointed out, it can be very brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I know some listening are probably thinking, wow, that's quite a tangent that I didn't expect about trapping. Uh, and the point of all that is, is when we lose our connection to these natural activities, and I think you and I believe that trapping connects you to those natural activities, uh, we start to lose some of the reality of what's going on out there. Or, or just how what and also we lose how we play a part in that uh because of our disconnectedness i mean I'm, my life is a is a reflection of my life experiences the way i see the world and if my life experiences don't ever let me see natural things happening i'm gonna have a view of the world that does not at all have a a realistic uh reflection of natural cycles and natural things and natural places so well, it's it's not just it's not just the wild that this is happening though um all of all of society it seems is breaking into tribes and the yeah. only voices you're hearing are the other uh, other voices in your echo chamber and and that mm -hmm. that is dividing us up so badly because now we we don't understand what, what other person's life is i have this call it childish you know, Sandy would be rolling her eyes at this moment or whatever. I have this belief that if people uh, would would sit down with an open mind, there, there'd be a lot less difficulties, right? But there, yep. people just don't have time for it. It seems um, they, as long as they can um, feel that they've justified the the uh, the time spent or the emotion spent, they, they, then they're good with however the, it came down, right? What what decision was made? Yeah, yeah. and that's where I think. Someone like you, Rich, I, I don't know if you realize it, but as uncomfortable as it might be at times, you sticking your neck out there to have honest conversations with people about trapping, because you've made many references to how many people you've engaged with and encountered who don't quite get this trapping gig. You, you, I think you said if, if they leave at least listening or, or something, you consider it a success. And neutral, those, yeah, yeah th those are the kind of discussions that they take time. They may not be as productive of a use of your time as one might hope for. And there might be some times of discomfort in there, but that's a way better outcome for a discussion and an understanding of these topics than to just get on social media and try to get it, say something where you know all your buddies are going to agree with you. And, you know, that, Sometimes that, confusion starts in the in the, the in the the tiniest misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's funny how the the world jumps. But we at one time we had a, a seal harvest in Canada. We still do, now, but but, but right. at one time, but not since the eighties have we been able to to hunt the 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 pups, and the pups were white, right? As they yep. as they grow older, as they mature, they turn gray, and they you know the, this is for the for the harp seals and, and that. And we had a person contact us uh, on about a YouTube we'd put up, and we were we were trapping weasels, you know the the ermine, the little white guy, right? right. Yep. And they said, "Isn't it illegal to kill the white guys, the the baby white ones?" And and I was <laughs> I was sitting there, kind of a dazed look on my face, and Sandy started laughing, and she said, "They think it's like seals." And all of a sudden, the connection was made. Well, so then we had a big discussion, you know, open forum on uh, on the you know on YouTube and that. And the person came around and said, "Oh, so it's not a baby then? No, this is these are adults, you know." And and yeah. explained how how it all worked. Well, there was one person, 
and perhaps others that thought the same thing. I mean, if one person thinks that they can't be all alone, right? I mean, what's the chances of right. me searching out the, you know, the one person in the world that thinks that way? So how many people did we, did we actually enlighten there? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was just a silly misunderstanding. You know, so, some, some of the stuff isn't silly and some of it is no misunderstanding. Some of it's very dedicated. And I don't understand people who have nothing more to do better to do with their life than, than, than those kind of things. <laughs> uh, we, we encounter plenty of them in our discussion. Don't we? I, but. I, I would, I would probably be more successful on the business side if I wasn't quite so passionate about, about making sure the truth got out. I know we've, mm-hmm. we've ha- had offers for, for some stuff that just wasn't, you know, wasn't showing what we, what we wanted to show. And I, I just, I think that there's nothing more important than the truth. And I mean, if we can't do that with, with with something as basic as you know that everybody used to do i mean you and i aren't mm-hmm. that old randy and we were we were both you know it was the first thing that we that we started you know yeah no I, and, and uh, in spite of its critics i will my content will always have some trapping on it and if i was not so busy in the fall with our hun- hunting content in the fall i i'd be doing more trapping i'm jealous of you rich you get to do a platform called Trapping Inc. <laughs> yeah. When, when you were a kid growing up, did you think that you would ever have your livelihood and your daily life teaching people how to trap? Could you have even drawn that? If your fifth grade teacher said, what are you going to be when you grow up? Would you have been able to paint that as your future position in life? No. I mean, and and the worst part of that. Yeah, but but the worst part is I would have laughed at you because hell everybody yeah. knows how to trap. Right. <laughs> who, who, who am I going to who am I going to teach how to trap? That's how far the world's come. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> and it, it's funny you say that. If I think about all the kids I grew up with who trapped, we had a spring beaver season in Minnesota that was mostly it started like March fifteenth and ran to the end of April, I think. There was not a kid in my town, my age, who didn't know a lot about beaver trapping. I mean, they could look at it and say, you know what? I think that one there, that'll be an XL, man. Good job. Or, hey, uh, you want want me to uh, wring the back legs off that thing? Well, every kid in town knew when you meant wring the back legs off, that it meant you're getting ready to skin this thing. Or, you know, if uh, everyone knew who the fur buyer was when Marv Smith came to town, the question at the, at the restaurant would be, are you buying them in the round in the green or you need them fleshed and stretched? Well, if you would say that in a world today of people, no one would have a clue what you meant if you said buy something in the round or buy it green. Well, every kid in my town knew that meant whether you had to skin it or not. And yep. that you're going to get a little bit less because he, he'd say, oh, I'll just buy him by the tail. In other words, he'd come and count the tails and he'd say, here, 20 bucks for every tail I counted. Well, we were all kids. We knew exactly what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, who were, when I was in fifth grade, who was I going to teach about beaver trapping? Nobody, because every kid in my class was beaver trapping. Yeah. And but when I was in fifth grade, I was probably voted most likely to be in jail when I was later <laughs> later in life. <laughs> and then you met Sandy. Sandy hey, rescued you from a life of imprisonment. Do you know how, how, how some Asian cultures believe that if you rescue somebody, if you save somebody's life, you're responsible for them? Yeah. She that's where she's at. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm never going to uh, save her life to make it even. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I am. That's another part of what I love about your platform, Rich. Is I see you and Sandy out there doing this together. And I, when people see you and Sandy out trapping together, out hunting together, do they? When you say, "Oh, well, she's a," uh, you know, she's been worked her way up the the world of the banking world and now she's in the investment wealth management world do you ever get people look at you like are you for real man yeah i mean (laughs) it's just and, and i'm not saying that that can't be the case but if i told somebody that hey i want to introduce you to this amazing woman who she's a wealth manager at this really large institution and oh, in the uh, in her sideline gig, her and her husband run a trapping show. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that conversation like, happens a lot. And that's where I, I ended up. Like, I've got my new sideline being the, the trophy husband, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I go I, I I get to go out and uh, you know meet with uh, with, with her friend or uh, her her clients and that because they're interested in it and I yeah. you know it, it doesn't pay well I, I still get one pillow and half half a bed but well, some nights not even a half you the bed get, you get you get half the bed that's what I said no, some nights not 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 half but I mean between my wife and the dog I don't even get a third of the bed. <laughs> we we have two big uh two big dogs they they're all crate trained but okay i i spend a lot of time with these people because people who are especially you know now like i mean these are wealthy people these are wealthy people that have um money to spend and and they're so they they have time for for past times so where they have time for influence you know it, it's important you know to to educate people like that but most of them are already already interested they're just absolutely fascinated um the uh, group that she joined like that is how they introduced her that she, her and her husband not you know not that she's wealth manager she's her and her husband have a tv show a trapping tv show you know <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is so funny how it goes randy i mean somebody who laughs a lot like like you and i do have you ever been walking through a store and all of a sudden you laugh and you watch four heads turn around and look at you because they don't know who you are until they hear your laugh and then yep. it's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting to, um, I also talk about, you know, with, with Sandy is that she did nothing when we got married. She had been fishing once in her life. and Oh, I, her, okay. When you said nothing, I thought you meant like she was <laughs> sitting there twiddling her thumbs. Okay. She'd done nothing in the outdoor space. She hadn't learned how to cook either. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm, I'm, I'm sending this thing to her. So we had, all of, we had all of you who in. don't know Rich and Sandy, Sandy will put him in his place so fast. And, and here's this big, tough guy, Rich, muscled up. Look, looks like he just got off the, the training for the Navy SEALs. And when Sandy shows up, he's just like a little kitty cat. <laughs> yeah, we we had some adventures in cooking and and firefighting management in the first early years. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, to get back, get back, yeah, off, get back uh, on track. Here. <laughs> she uh, she didn't didn't trap hunt or, or or fish or anything, and then you know we were. We met in um, in March. We were married in in October. Uh, our our honeymoon was a moose hunt. You know, <laughs> cool. But, well, I, I thought it was kind of cool. I, I, we had nothing. I mean, we, God Almighty, yeah. that was back in seventy seven. You know, so we, we, you know, you're poor, right? Yep. And uh, probably in seventy seventy nine, and we, we were had a little you know a long weekend it was so it was it was a long week in october that we got married so then we went for a tour we went and hit you know stayed in a hotel in uh in white court and then drove over to hinton and you know up against the rockies and that and stayed in a hotel there and it was probably the second and third time i ever stayed in a hotel in my life you know and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> true story man true story and and then of course to get from from over there from from the rockies back home well we had to drive through all my my moose hunting area <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wasn't long. I, I think I think the seed was already there. I mean, I think she, I don't know whether she was that infatuated with me or just there was an interest. But but pretty quick, she she discovered that you know she was going to come along with me if there was going to be any you know if we're going to yeah. have a future together because that was a very very big part of my life. Right? You know, when you're yeah. that young, you don't think about those things. Like I mean. She met me when I was at, at school and in, in trade school getting a, a my journeyman certificate and I'm away from home and, and and you know she doesn't know anything about how I actually live, right? Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, short very short time later where you you're married and, and you're cohabitating, it's like, what do you mean you're never home? You're either working or you're going hunting and fishing and you know, that kind of stuff. And but I take a look at this and I I, I think she was my first success as a, a as a converter, a conversion, you know. I I <laughs> well, <laughs> she cool. she'd never she'd never shot a gun. 
She never shot a gun. And so for our very first Christmas together, I'd always wanted this really cool 270 Winchester, right? With a nice yep. Redfield scope. Remember the Redfield Whitefield? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that was cool back then. So that's what I got her for our very first Christmas together. And, and I was so excited. Because, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I thought I'm getting really cool 270, right? But she was, she, she'd taken up shooting and, and, and 22s and, 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 uh, shotgun and that kind of stuff. And we were shooting rabbits and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And so we, she was, she'd taken up uh, a little bit of hunting and I bought her this, <laughs> and I gave her this gun for Christmas. <laughs> and here's one of my, one advice. Always keep them guessing, guys. Always keep them guessing. Cause when I had that to her, she, this is big. <laughs> long box and she opens it up and, and the look on her face like her jaw fell open and of course I'm just thinking that she's just wonderstruck by it. <laughs> Years later she tells me she's, <laughs> that was the, literally the last thing I ever thought I was going to get. <laughs> uh, well it must have worked Rich because 41 years later you guys are still married. Yeah, absolutely and she uh she took to that gun and uh, she doesn't shoot it now it's put away and and uh it, it's a memory but yeah she shot a lot of animals with that gun she shot it way better than i did and yeah i was before we, we started this podcast i was just doing some editing some some uh, hunting uh we did last june in in africa and the gal sure shoots sure, good good and we have so much fun together uh she's my my buddy out trapping uh, out on the the trap line uh, we call her the queen of fire because she loves to keep everything warm and toasty <laughs> I'm, I'm the only guy in a cabin where it's 40 below and i got a window open to so i can breathe in bed yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th this podcast of all the outdoor podcasts this podcast hunt talk radio is known for its marriage advice so okay <laughs> I, i'm i'm thinking here I, and the reason that i always give marriage advice is i've got a crew that they're either dating and soon to be married or been married a few years so i've been at it 31 years my wife still hasn't figured out the mistakes of her past, so she's not corrected them yet. And I think that makes me qualified to give marriage advice. Because, I mean, after you've done something for more than 30 years, you, you, you kind of feel like you got it figured out, right? Well, <laughs> you, you've got me beat by 10 years. And your, your first gift was a firearm. <laughs> that, I, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out if we should incorporate that as some of our marriage advice. <laughs> that, you know, I, I, and I don't want this to sound like it's always the male female because I've got listeners where the the female of the relationship is the hunter and the male is not that much into it. So it, this could go either way here. You know? <laughs> so we'll use the term spouse. Okay. So if you, if you buy your spouse a firearm for your first Christmas present, you might be a red, it, red dick. <laughs> there, there, for sure. <laughs> But the, the sample set that I'm looking at here of people I know who have been married 41 years, that that's not a very big sample set in today's world, Rich. You no. might be on to something there. <laughs> Actually, you, do you want some serious, some serious advice? Yeah, okay. but lay it on. 41 yeah, I mean, years. You, I, I'm taking notes here because you've got me by 10 years. I am hoping that my wife doesn't ditch me in the next 10 years. So I, I try to behave myself, but I'm open to all good advice. Well, it's Everybody talks about how you're you're in love or, or whatever. And I'm going to tell you, over 41 years, and you probably know over 31 years, it seems like love can come and go. But respect is what is what counts. Always respecting that other person. If you respect that other person... That means you you are concerned about how your actions might affect them, and when that that that's when truly when relationships work is when you're selfless. Um, everybody everybody you know has those days where oh man, what my spouse is doing is just getting on my nerves, and at that moment you should hear this echo in the back of your skull saying, "And what you're doing right now is getting on her nerves." You know, so pay attention. There you go, <laughs> there you go. man. You 
So, are you also a marriage counselor, Rick? <laughs> Trophy husband, trapper, communicator, and marriage counselor. <laughs> oh, it's I, I have the ability to uh, you know ha- have all this time. I've just I've been uh, have had uh, you know the seniority going on here, and and you know looking back at, at what works and what doesn't work, and it's uh-huh. it's. Easy. It, it really, people talk about you have to work so hard. At, no, you don't. You have to work on your own stuff. Yeah. And each person works on their own stuff. And after that, it's pretty dang easy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm living uh, evidence to the, the idea that if you think the world is wrong, you might want to look at your own world to start with. Yeah. Because most of the things that I have struggled with in life are of my own doing. Uh, and that, that can come down to marriage, marriage advice, relationships. Yep. yep. I, I, I was probably the most untrained, least qualified person my wife could have picked to get married to. My God. I still don't, I I, don't know why she did, but I thank my lucky stars every day that she did. I was I was just lucky that I had a full set of teeth because I didn't have a, a full set of <laughs> I, I didn't have I didn't have a full set of clothes I didn't have shoes you know what I mean I mean I was if you looked up Jack Pine Savage in the in the dictionary me and my brother were there that was our picture that was it was next to it you know I've, I've starred in several Nat Geos when I was younger you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this this is a confession, and my wife loves to tell this story. That the first time she met me, I I had one set of clothes that I dared go out in public with, and she <laughs> saw me in that. She came to my place of work, which was a sawmill, and this is how poor I was. I would take my old jeans and cut pieces off the den of denim. And I would use duct tape to wrap around my thigh where I had holes in the thigh of my jeans. <laughs> <laughs> and the elastic in my underwear had gotten so old and frayed and cracked that I couldn't keep my underwear up. So I would bunch it up on the side in a big knot and I'd take a little strip. I'd cut my duct tape into like a, I don't know half inch strip and I'd ball it up real tight by pulling on it. And I'd, I'd then wrap this tape around where I had the ball. And so I had like this little piggy tail underwear sticking out the side (laughs) of my, where my jeans and my t-shirt met. So she comes out to the sawmill one day and now she sees how I dress. I I remember my boots. I had duct tape around the toe of my boots because the sole was coming off from the boot. And she just looked at me <laughs> like, is this, uh, is this like the standard uniform of mill workers? Do you guys all look like R2D2 or C3PO? You know, you, you get all shined up with all this duct tape. That, that, that's how poor and starved out I was as a college student. And somehow this woman saw through all of that. I, I still am at a loss for how she could see through uh, you'd think the glare of the duct tape reflecting back would have, <laughs> would have scared her off if not just for the state of disrepair i was in anyhow but you, uh, you, you guys were you guys were at least one income tax bracket above us you had duct tape <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I i i've said for for a long time that to Sandy, I said she'd never get rid of me because the the anchor is rusted to the boat, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> she she was stuck. But but yeah, it was uh, for the longest time we were the strangest couple because she's very classy, she's very you know yep. dresses well and all that kind of stuff, and I'm I'm not. <laughs> That's about as <laughs> as polite as it gets. <laughs> and and you know, I had people you know sit me down and and say you know. So seriously, you know, we're having having a shot here, you know. How did you end up with her? Uh, I said, well, <laughs> I freely admit I'm her, I'm her only blonde moment in life, you know. <laughs> but when, when when somebody could see through all of that, you know, because we we tried so hard to to show our good sides, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
somebody can see through all that, then then maybe you can forgive them for for uh, hanging pantyhose on the on the shower rod. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Well, I, well, as you explain that, Rich, I think the inside ticket. So uh, this is based on my assessment of growing up on the Canadian border and spending a lot of time in Fort Francis, Sioux Narrows, and Kenora, okay. uh, all parts of northwestern Ontario. When you said you had a full set of teeth, <laughs> that is that is what did it for you. Because I'm trying to think how many people I encountered by the time I was 16 in my many fishing travels. I spent most of my summer up in northwest Ontario. Having a full set of teeth was quite a novelty among the people, as I recall. <laughs> it, and I, I attributed it all to two things, playing hockey before the days of face masks and the fact that you guys had that super powerful hopped up beer. <laughs> and there was no place I traveled. You could go to Fort Francis on any evening and you could watch multiple fist fights out in the street. It was, and if you went, if you went to Kenora, you thought this was like the training ground for <laughs> All Star Wrestling or something. U, UFC, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. One of that's one of the things that I've, I've had difficulties with because you know there were times when you'd be out with your buddies or or, or buddies of buddies that kind of things. People get drunk and and then there'd be a fight, but the next day it was over. And yeah. Oh, and, oh, yeah. We're pals. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Got, got a little. Uh, the word I always was got a little out of hand. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. As you're, as you're holding your thumb against your front teeth, trying to keep them up in your head, you know. <laughs> it's okay. Go, yeah. Got a little hair. What, what's the better? <laughs> yeah. Well, people, I use the term. You know, I better be careful, or I'll be doing a tooth inventory. Yeah. That was a common thing. Where I grew up in a little logging town, and guys would wake up in the morning and count how many teeth they still had left. There was a, there was a tooth inventory to make sure you didn't get them knocked out the night before. I'd so, actually, uh, I'd actually lost a tooth before I'd met Sandy. Uh, one, one of my oh, front oh. teeth, uh, and it would, I had it replaced with a. Oh, and it was. You, do, you, do you know how? Dentistry was not an exact science back then. <laughs> no, it wasn't even an art back then. No, it days. wasn't. It was it was pretty crude. They nailed this peg in the front of my my, my mouth, and and like I mean, it was like snow blinding chiclet white. You know what I mean? And <laughs> <laughs> as, as white as you may think your teeth are, Randy, nobody's teeth are perfectly white. And no, so I had this. It, it, it got so that I, I I was afraid to grin at that because there'd be this. People would be would recoil in horror, being flashed and blinded by this tooth, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, quite often you kind of hold your hand up to your face when you're laughing or whatever, so nobody would see this this freaking tooth. But she she didn't see that for, for the first little while, so we, we were okay. But I had uh, that. <laughs> and not everything had to do with hockey. Most of the time, for us anyway, I mean, we 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 get stuck in the in the mud. You got a, a big old jackal. You know, mm -hmm. four, four foot jack all. You're jacking it up to throw the the, the truck up to to throw uh, wood underneath the the tires yep. so you can get out. That jack slides on the on the bumper, hits you in the face, or, or you go to let off on it and it, and it kicks back. Yeah. For me, it was it, 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 I turned around and as I turned back, it it is slid, kicked, and hit me in the mouth and broke out one of my my Ooh. my front teeth. Oh yeah, I was, rang my bell pretty good too. But yeah, so I had to go get that. <laughs> Had to go get that fixed, and yeah, it was, it was awful. I, I still look at the pictures back then, and yeah, this, this neon chiclet tooth on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm still convinced, though, the full set of teeth is what convinced a woman of class and intelligence like Sandy yeah. to to decide she could overlook whatever I, else I must, you, you had going for you. I had to be a heck of a salesman, though, because, I mean, she was, you know, they, they lived in, in, in central Alberta, and I was from the north, you know. I mean, that was a pretty big pull. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, so geography of Alberta, people who aren't aware that Calgary is, you know, you got Lethbridge and then yeah. Calgary and then up there. You know, Edmonton, you're getting pretty far up there. Were you even north of Edmonton? Yes. Yes, we are. We still are. We're actually um, northwest, almost forty-five degrees northwest of uh, uh, of Edmonton. We're over on uh, the BC border. Like uh, Dawson Creek is only eighty kilometers or eighty miles away. Uh, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I think it's another eight nine hours from here 
to go to to make it to the territories. Like wow. it's fifth, oh, twelve in twelve hours, I can be at, at the board, border at Coots. So it'd be where I can be at the border at Coots, Coots, Montana. Oh, okay. Twelve, yep. twelve hours driving from here, I can I can be. And, and I mean, we have nice speed limits here too. Where you know it's seventy and eighty miles an hour, like like you have in Montana. Yeah. Although, yeah. Although you guys actually have a speed limit now, don't you? We do. It used to be reason, reasonable and prudent, but the federal government <laughs> said we're not going to give you highway funding if you don't at least put some number on there. So, <laughs> I a lot my, of places it's eighty-five now. I talked my way out of a well, not all, all the way out of it, but I, I got a greatly reduced fine. I got caught pulling a boat in the, in the middle of the night in in uh, Montana at ninety miles an hour and. And then, <laughs> yeah, and I had him talk down because I had a dual wheel truck, and I had mm-hmm. him talk down that, that it wasn't a truck because in Montana at the time that was considered a big truck, and and it did have a speed limit. And I says, well, how would I know oh. that this was a big truck? I I don't know. I'm from Alberta. I said, look look at the plates, and so I had him talk down to that, and and I was just about scot free, and then he looked back and says, but you're pulling a boat, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up have to hand him fifty dollars and <laughs> off I went. But I figured, oh, damn. it was middle of the night, nobody around it was reasonable, prudent, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it, it used to I think a lot of people just kept five dollar bills on the dashboard because of the ticket, if you were beyond reasonable and prudent, I think was five bucks. And it's just like, here's your five bucks, let me on my way. Yeah. So <laughs> but I don't know how we got on. Oh, about how how far north of the border you lived. So, where was Sandy at geographically? Was she a southern farm girl? No, she was uh, Edmonton, oh. and uh, actually oh. to the east of Edmonton, over on the east side of uh, of Alberta, uh, near near the uh, the city of Lloydminster. So she's uh, she was about seven hours away. Yeah, but, okay. But it might, of all very large farm area that that kind of stuff no trees no no bush no no wild like it, there is up here right yeah yeah well rich i i'm gonna let her review this podcast before we release it normally i send it to the host or to the guest for their approval but since i know sandy i think i'm gonna just send it directly to her and say sandy you want some blackmail material i i got it here and, oh uh, <laughs> she's she she is is a darling and i mean when we go out to out to the trap line and that like uh we're we're headed out here in a couple of days and uh, to do some summer stuff and and uh we had a bridge washout so i gotta i gotta build a bridge that's part of of the owning of of the the land and is that you are mm-hmm. not not our owning of the rights that you have to maintain those trails and that kind of stuff so oh I, wow i got a sawmill uh and i we, there's one silly for whatever reason the, the this combination of a of a beaver dam and a spring together and it never freezes and so in in the wintertime, uh, you know, it's, it's got these straight up and down banks. So I just, I just built a bridge across it, but then we had a bridge washout last year. And so I'll go and saw me some planks and that, but she looks so forward to going out. Uh, I cannot begin. I mean, I know how trapping makes my soul feel. I, I know how, mm-hmm. how incredibly, you know, you're the literally people talk about how you shed all the cares and worries when doing something. Well, when I walk out there, it's just like, I forget anything and everything, the whole world, everything's gone. I mean, you're you're just immersed in that, in that nature. And it is so good for me. I'm sure my blood pressure drops by 40 points and, and her to have her come along and share it with me. Like, I mean, for it to be as important to her, I still pinch myself over that after 41 years, Randy, that <laughs> cool. that's something that is so important to me is, is just as important to her. Yeah. You know? yeah. That, that's, that's very that's, cool. That's probably why you've made it 41 years, Rich, even in spite of buying her that 270 as her first <laughs> Christmas present. I'll, I, I'm going to run that one by my wife when I go home today. Hey, honey, you know, I didn't buy you a firearm for your first Christmas present. You mind if I buy you one for your 30, 30 first Christmas present? Yeah. Mm, I, I know what the look will be on that one. But uh, anyhow, Rich, uh, we're going to not let it be so long before we have another trapping discussion here. But I'm you and I both have work to do. So I, where can my audience follow you? Uh, a lot of people here in the lower 48, we can't get wild TV in Canada. But 
you you've got uh, a YouTube channel, Amazon yep. Prime podcast, website, Facebook, Instagram. Where are all those things where people can get a hold of you? If you go to uh, our our main web website is uh, trappinginc dot com, and you'll okay. find there's connections to everything there. Other than we we just started up a a subscription community, and it, I don't have links for it up there yet. But it's uh, it it's at locals dot com uh, slash trapping inc. And it what uh, you you can connect with us. You can uh, email us. You can talk to us. You can hit all our Facebook and our Instagram, all that kind of stuff for, from trappinginc dot com. It's it's easy. We uh, okay. enjoy hearing feedback from people. That's that's a fact. Well, I I. Uh... So I think some people are going to say, oh, trapping, this must be a low quality production. You have been in the video production business for 21 years. So your quality of video compared to most of what is out there in the trapping space, you are, I don't even want to say miles ahead. You're light years ahead of (laughs) most of the the production quality of what we see in the trapping space. So if you, if folks, you want to learn something about trapping, uh, learn a little bit about these two crazy Canadians called Rich and Sandy. Uh, <laughs> I would go out there and watch it. I get, uh, I get wrapped up on some of your, your videos and I'll be sitting there watching and I'll look. It's like, I just spent two hours and 20 minutes <laughs> listening to this chucklehead that I could have just picked up the phone or whatever and had the same entertainment value but it's uh, part of it is just i love to watch the trapping and uh, you and sandy are very very good very personable on camera that makes the audience connect and i i hope people go and watch and on amazon prime are you guys on amazon prime right we're we're on amazon prime you can once again search trapping tv we're also on pursuit again this year we'll be on q4 and uh, q1 Okay, pursuit yeah. channel. If if yep. I get Direct TV, I think that's six oh four on Direct TV. If I remember right, I don't know. I don't ever watch it. I'd have to ask my wife. She's the one who keeps the TV subscription intact. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Richard Mellon, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for your friendship and your years of putting up with me. Um, you know, I'm. I, I'd love someday to come and just spend a few days on your trap line. Well, so. the last time we talked, it was way back before the this virus continued being so stupid, and I had hopes of traveling down to Montana this summer and uh, go and do some fishing. I was I was gonna I didn't care if you came, but I, I understand your wife has a really nice boat, and we're we we're gonna go to Fort Peck. <laughs> she, she does, thanks to you. you. You know when she started deciding crankbaits was a good idea. When <laughs> when she when she heard from Richard Mellon that you know you can catch a lot of walleyes on crankbaits at Fort Peck, boom! <laughs> there went a twenty thousand dollar investment in crankbaits at my house thanks to you. <laughs> oh, so Some of you may not know, Rich used to fish the professional walleye trail. So my wife took none of my fishing advice and hung on every word that Rich might say related to walleye fishing. So. <laughs> oh, we, we were, we were hoping to get down there, but one, one day we will. And, uh, Hey, the, uh, Open invitation. If you got some time in December, like the first mm-hmm. couple weeks of December, everything is open. So you get everything from lynx to otter to, to Martin and Fisher and wolves and, Wolverine, come on up. I can put you to work. <laughs> uh, well, you, the only, since this is something you convert to a livelihood, I don't know if you'd let me on the knife end of things. You might say, look, buddy, I don't need a hole in my otter here, so get away. Maybe I could maybe I could go cut firewood since Sandy likes it 85 degrees in your cabin. <laughs> I might be able to do that coming from a logging family. I'm good at chopping holes in the ice. If you do any through the through the ice set for beaver, we we uh, do. Okay, 
I'm just trying to think what else I could do to put myself to use there. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, figure, I'll yeah. figure something out. You you have no idea. And then there's a whole other thing uh, about hauling wolf bait. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Think, things okay. like that, Randy, things like that are better learned firsthand than talked about. You know, <laughs> True. If, you t- if you tell people about it and then they never come for the firsthand experience. <laughs> True. All right. Well, whenever I have a December and I can get there, uh, don't be surprised if some dude with Montana license plates shows up in your driveway. That'd be absolutely perfect. (laughs) Cool. Well, thanks for your time, Rich. Really appreciate it. Have a great summer. Have a great season this year. Give Sandy my best and uh, we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. Well, thank you for having me and and say hi to your wife and and tell her I'm going to come fish in her boat one day. (laughs) <laughs> All right. She she would have an open invitation for you. You're you, you're kind of like that guy. She she thinks knows what he's talking about. For me, she'll ask, "Do you have a clue?" Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh man, that's that's a kick to the man card there." But she would never ask you that. So let's do it. <laughs> Take care, Rich. You bet. You too. <laughs>